again, uh, science is obviously a very collaborative endeavor, and uh, there's lots of students involved in the projects that I'm going to talk about, as well as collaborators from around the world. And, um, and science can't run without funding, so I'd like to thank my funding sources as well for uh, supporting my research. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit uh, broadly at first about what climate change means to the world uh, for us right now. Um, so there are approximately 110 million tons of fossil fuels released every day and concurrently uh, there are rising deaths because of air pollution. Um, so a few months ago schools in New Delhi were closed for a week because the air pollution was so poor. Uh, that the kids couldn't, couldn't actually attend school, and there's a lot of air quality issues that we're, we're having to deal with around the world because of this release of fossil fuels. If we look at how air temperatures have changed, um, the warmest year ever on record was 2016. That actually also was an El Nino year, um, and so that contributed to more rapid uh, rapid uh, warming, uh, but 2017 last year was the warmest non-El Nino record, um, and we've been getting a lot of, since 2000, a lot of years that are the warmest ever recorded, uh, and we keep seem to uh, beating our records each year. Uh, if you look at air temperatures in uh, around the Middle East in 2017, they're approached over 53 degrees Celsius. Uh, just as a note, humans cannot survive more than four to six hours outside at those temperatures. So we're kind of reaching these thresholds that are impacting people in a, in a big way. Extreme events are what's, what seems to be the big problem uh, right now and will continue to be over the next uh, few decades before we reach our new means. Um, so for example, you're familiar with extreme precipitation this past year because of Hurricane Harvey, uh, Hurricane Maria, all those hurricanes this year that have contributed to uh, extreme precipitation. In Argentina, sorry, we had uh, in 15 minutes 1.5 meters worth of hail. Um, and this is not, this is not normal. And <laughs> You hear that a lot in the news these days, this is not normal, but what we have had in the US is 14 1 in 1,000 year events. As you know, you cannot get a 1 in 1,000 year event every six months, but we're in that situation where extreme events are just becoming much more, much more frequent, although they're uh, statistically improbable. And so what I want to talk to you about today is the impacts of climate change on lakes. And um, I look at, at it in different ways. Um, so first, actually, my career sort of evolved in the opposite of how I'm going to tell you. So I started out looking at how climate change was going to impact fish populations in the future. And then um, I moved to the US, and there's a, half the population are climate deniers. Uh, in that country, and so I kind of switched focus for a couple years to think about how has climate change already impacted us. So rather than uh, building fancy statistical models for the future, what, what have we already seen? Um, and, and how can that help us understand what's going to happen, what we're, we might face in the future? Um, so first I'm going to talk to you about ice dynamics and water temperatures. And then I'll switch over and talk about fish populations and the fish communities uh, in Ontario um, more specifically. Okay. okay, so first talking about lake ice. So the, the first story, and there'll be three uh, stories associated with lake ice. So the first is using lake ice as an indicator of climate. And I'll tell you in a second why lake ice is especially effective. Uh, lake ice is a mediator of water temperatures, and then third, consequences of lake ice uh, phenology on the biology of lakes. And so lake ice has been collected by humans around the world for a very long time, and they actually end up being one of the longest records, climate records, collected by man um, that we have. 
And so one of the lake records that I work with is in Japan, uh, Lake Suwa in Japan. It's in the Japanese Alps. And they've been, the Shinto priests there have been collecting information on when the lake freezes since 1442. And the reason is that there's a shrine on this lake and they have a legend in the Shinto tradition that there's a god and goddess that live together on one side of the lake uh, in a shrine. And sometimes what happens when people live together for too long, they got into a disagreement. And so the <laughs> goddess moved out and she built herself a shrine on the other end of the lake. And every year the god would cross the lake with his dragon and uh, leave this ridge on, on, the, on the ice. And the Shinto priest thought this was uh, the god's footsteps as he, as he crossed the lake every winter to make amends with the Japanese goddess. And so what they did was every year that they saw this ridge form, this ridge actually just formed a few weeks ago again, and uh, the Shinto priests go, uh, they perform a purification ceremony, uh, and then they conduct a ceremony on the lake and they record the date that this ridge formed, the direction that the ridge is pointed, and, uh, and the height of this ridge. And they can use this, they've actually been using this since 1442 to forecast rice harvest. And uh, the years that didn't have this ridge form were actually associated with some of the worst famines in Japan. Well, what we did was my collaborator went to Japan and talked to these, we talked to these Shinto priests through translators and, uh, and, get, uh, and got their climate record. And so they had them on ice paper and we converted them into Excel spreadsheets, basically. <laughs> um, and so we got an indication of how the climate's been changing. And so we can make graphs like these. Um, so something, this is an extreme event when there's no ice formed on a lake. What you can see that you can see on the y-axis, that's a frequency. How frequently did that extreme event happen within a 50-year period? And here's the time series from 1443 to 2014. And what you can see in the first 250 years of the record was that the lake did not freeze three times. And those, as I mentioned, were associated with some of the worst famines in Japanese history. You can see in the last 250 years, there's a lot more events in which the lake does not freeze. And in the last uh, 65 years, the lake does not freeze one out of every four years. In the last 10 years, the lake did not freeze five times. And so something as simple as does a lake freeze or not can give us an indication of how climate is changing. So somebody might think, well, hey, that's just one record that's extending before the Industrial Revolution, do you have any other information? Well, actually, the Scandinavians also were great record keepers. And uh, this record in the Torn River in Scandinavia was started in 1693 by a merchant named Olaf Album. And the cool thing about working with these records is you also get an idea of history and uh, all the different events that took place in the region. And so this time record is, this ice record is meticulously kept. They've recorded where each person was standing when they looked at uh, the river um, and examined the ice breakup in the river, who was there, uh, where they were, and there were only six years that were missing uh, in this record um, from 1715 to 1721 when Russia invaded Finland and Olaf had to, had to uh, escape. And so that was the only six years that he couldn't take measurements. And, uh, and then he came back. And from then, uh, many people have monitored this, uh, the ice breakup in Torn River, including Celsius, Hallant, monitoring organizations. And now they have these ice breakup guessing competitions. So we know to the minute when the ice broke up in the river because hundreds of thousands of people are betting on, on this event every, every year. But it can also give us a really long climate record. Um, and so here what we have is the ice breakup date from 1693 to here from 2013. And looking at some of the coldest events, 
They all happened before the start of the Industrial Revolution in, uh, in Scandinavia. And the warmest events, shortest ice, ice durations, uh, and earliest ice breakups have, have occurred in the, last, uh, in the last few decades. And so what else can we do with these records? Well, once we have these time series, we can actually do a lot with them. Um, and they can reveal interesting things about the climate uh, extending before the Industrial Revolution. And so here, this is a wavelet analysis. You don't need to worry about the statistics here, but uh, the, this is period, the length of the, of the oscillation that we're looking at, and here's the time series for Japan. And all I want you to look at are these red blobs. So you see red blobs in dark circles. And this gray, faint gray line is the start of the Industrial Revolution in Japan. And what you can see is that in the past, before this gray line, there's a lot of these red blobs, and they're occurring at these high frequencies. So 16 to 64 year periods. Here's one that's a bit shorter. Uh, this one extends even longer, up to 128 years. And after the gray line, it, they've disappeared. So you don't see those anymore. We'll look at the Torn River um, time series as well. And again, you can see these red blobs before this line here represents the start of the Industrial Revolution in Finland. And what you see is that uh, we've got lots of these red blobs at these short time series, but also these longer time oscillations. Whereas after this line, all along the, the blobs in the longer time periods are gone. And what that seems to be evidence of is these shift in these large scale climate oscillations. So if you think of the El Nino Southern Oscillation, the North Atlantic Oscillation, you've heard of El Nino probably in the news. You think of those being stable over time. Well, I did anyways. And what we uncovered is that actually because of climate change, these, these uh, large scale oscillations that are operating at a global scale are no longer, um, they're, they're actually happening at much shorter time frequencies. So if we think about the North Atlantic Oscillation, what climate scientists have found is that uh, the NAO, the North Atlantic Oscillation, has been stabilized in the positive phase as carbon dioxide concentrations have been increasing. And what we're noticing is that a six to 10 year period is much more influential now, and in the past, when the Shinto priests started taking these records, it was a multi-decadal uh, cycle. The same is true for ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. So we know of that oscillation happening at about a three to seven year cycle. So every three to seven years, you hear about, oh, it's a strong El Nino year. We're going to have a milder winter. Um, well, back when these records were starting, there were 82 to 90 year cycle length. So what we're uncovering with these really long climate records is that there's been a structural shift in these teleconnections. And what that might mean for us is more extreme events that we're experiencing in our climate today than might have been occurring in the past. And so why does ice melt earlier and break later? Well, we've done this for lakes across the northern hemisphere. So there's about 150 lakes that have been measured for at least 75 years, um, and some going, quite a few going back to 150 year records and, and even further. And what we're, what we're finding out is that there's three things that are impacting the timing of when a lake freezes and melts. And so the first is climate change, and increases in air temperature and increases in carbon dioxide concentrations are correlated to earlier ice breakup and later ice freeze up. Uh, climate drivers such as El Nino Southern Oscillation, North Atlantic Oscillation, and solar sunspots also dictate when a lake freezes or, or melts. And then finally, local weather identifies to the day. So sort of, is it windy? Have we had a few days of warm temperatures? Have we had some rain in the few days preceding ice, uh, spring ice melt? And that helps you figure out to the day when ice the lake will melt or, or freeze. 
So if you're in, ever in any ice breakup guessing competitions, you can use this information, which I have, to, to win, um, to win uh, pools, uh, betting pools, to understand when is this lake going to freeze or is it going to melt. And so for Ontario, actually, um, what we've been projecting is about a month shorter ice, um, ice on periods going into 2050. Um, so Ontario is expecting where we're, we've been seeing a decline of about a week over the last 100 years, and it's been accelerating. Uh, and so in the next 50 years, we're expecting a shorter duration of about a month. Um, and this has obviously has consequences for, for the biology of the lake, but also for ice fishing, for skating, for snowmobiling, um, and then as well as other, other sorts of human uh, related activities. So where are we going with ice? So um, there's a few projects that are on the go um, right now. So the, uh, one of the major themes in our lab uh, right now is looking at extreme events. And as I mentioned earlier, extreme events are, are the things that we're, uh, we need to try to figure out scientifically uh, what might cause them, how might lakes respond to these extreme events. And so we're looking at lakes around the world that have already started not freezing. So there's about 30 lakes that seem to um, not freeze every year now, and we're trying to figure out why. Um, so it seems like the deeper lakes are the ones that are at most uh, risk of not, not freezing, as well as the, uh, as the lakes at lower elevation. And, uh, and then what we're hoping to do is then create a vulnerability assessment to identify which lakes might not freeze in the near future and also under scenarios of climate change and what kind of climatic conditions may, uh, may lead to that. Uh, another avenue of research that we're conducting right now is looking at the e um, ecological and socioeconomic implications of lack of um, lake ice. And things like nutrients are being altered, primary productivity is being changed, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, as well as fish populations. Uh, but we're seeing um, loss of ice fishing opportunities and loss of ice fishing tournaments across North America. Uh, skating competitions that have been consistent in uh, the Netherlands and Sweden are being canceled. And so that has huge economic uh, and social implications. And the loss of winter ice roads. So some of the populations in James Bay, uh, indigenous populations in James Bay will not be getting access to food, power, um, energy resources as um, in a, as more, as a systematic way as it used to be because of these loss of winter ice roads. Uh, the last project that I'm currently heading is looking at the loss of human life, which I never thought I'd ever work, uh, work on being an ecologist. Um, but what we're finding, so this year is a perfect example, is that there's a lot more drownings because of less stable ice. So this year had been cold, and uh, but then we've been having cold warm events and so what happens is that the ice isn't as stable it's not as thick but when you go out on a not this weekend but maybe a couple weekends ago and it was snowing you might a snowmobiler might think oh this ice is thick enough and um, and so they've been um, drowning and actually this pattern we've in the last four weeks I've put data together for Canada, US, uh, Sweden, Finland, Latvia, uh, Germany, Italy, and all around the world, there seem to be more hu the loss of human life and more drownings because of less stable, less stable ice. So we're trying to work with drowning societies to do some education around, around what ice, what, what does the structure of ice need to be for people to actually go on there and do recreational activities. Um, so lake ice has a big, big impact um, for, for us and for, for the ecology. So I'm going to shift it back to ecology for now and talk about water temperatures. And, uh, and so this is a collaboration that was done uh, with over 80 people from around the world. 
And, um, and so we worked with people that have been collecting information on lake water temperatures for the last 25 years from over 350 lakes around the world. And we also worked with NASA to get an idea of how water temperatures are changing from space uh, using satellites so that we could access, you'll see why, this is our map of the lakes that we've, we've looked at. And they actually represent 50% of the world's freshwater supply. And in yellow are the lakes that were measured by people. And so you can see that they're around the Great Lakes uh, in Europe <coughs> and some in Australia. And they're actually really close to universities. So wherever there's a university and a professor in limnology who's been there for a while, they've actually been collecting uh, water temperature data. But you can see the rest of the world was missing uh, for, with information. So that's why we teamed up with NASA to get an idea of how water temperatures where people aren't collecting them are changing. And so what we found was that actually 90% of the world's lakes are warming. And uh, in red are, these are the trends over the uh, per decade here. Um, and in red, the warmer colors represent lakes that are warming faster. And in blue are the lakes that are, um, that are cooling. And what you can see across the world is that lakes are warming. And actually, the fastest warming lakes are in the north and in ice-covered lakes. So those lakes are actually warming twice as fast. So Canadian lakes tend to be warming twice as fast as the global average. And actually, Lake Superior is the second fastest warming lake in the world. Um, and, and some of our other Great Lakes are actually warming at much higher rates than, uh, than the global average. You can also see that 10% of the lakes are cooling. Uh, and they're actually cooling for the same reason, which is pretty interesting. So lakes in northern Canada and actually the Tibetan Plateau here uh, seem to be cooling because the glaciers in the region are melting. So the glaciers are melting and bringing in, right now they're bringing in cold water into, into those lakes and thus cooling, cooling the temperatures. Uh, lakes in Florida and the European Alps are also cooling. And this is because of land use changes, changing the clarity of water. And so people have been uh, cutting down some of the trees around the area and changing water clarity. And that's in response in the short term has been contributing to cooling, uh, cooling water temperatures. But you can see it's a pretty, otherwise it's a pretty consistent pattern around the world. And actually lakes are warming faster than oceans and faster than air temperatures. So they're sort of this bellwether of, of the amount of warming that's going on. Yep. Are you taking surface temperature, or at what depth are you taking the temperature? Yep, so this, is, this map here is for surface water temperatures um, at about 0.5 to 1 meter below the surface. Um, we actually did a study in North America looking at uh, the bottom temp. We looked actually the whole water column. And uh, all of the lakes in, in that data set were warming at the surface. But at the bottom, actually half of them were warming and half of them were cooling. And that seems to be an indication of water clarity. So as water clarity has been changing. So in some areas, it's changing as we have more precipitation events. That's increasing runoff uh, from, from the landscape. And that's cooling uh, the water temperatures uh, at the bottom of lakes. And some of them are warming as, as the clarity of the water is increasing. So it seems to be, uh, at the surface, it's a pretty consistent pattern. But as you go deeper into the lake, it depends on what's happening in the landscape uh, around the lakes. But that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> so something I was particularly interested in was wondering if how so are lakes that are right next to each other behaving the same way? So this was the first global study done on water temperatures. And previously, people worked on within their region. And they said, OK, well, these lakes, are they all warming at the same rate? But what we found, and it's a fancy statistical analysis, but I just want you to look at the colors, is you can see similar colors in different areas of the world. And actually, what we found is that 
their lakes in Ontario are not just behaving like lakes in Ontario. They're behaving like lakes around the world that have similar characteristics. And so if you're experiencing similar amounts of air temperatures warming, you're experiencing similar amounts of water temperatures warming. The other factor is also solar radiation. So the amount of solar radiation hitting the Earth's surface has changed over the past 25 years. And that's in response to a phenomena called global dimming and global brightening. So in North America, actually, our lakes are becoming, our, actually our world is becoming brighter. And we're experiencing less cloud cover. And that's in response to improved air quality, actually. Uh, and uh, we have less cloud formation. And uh, we're experiencing higher amounts of solar radiation that's hitting uh, the Earth's surface. Lakes in the southern hemisphere, and actually region in the southern hemisphere, are experiencing some dimming right now because of increased um, greenhouse gas emissions in India, China, and some places in Asia where it's creating sort of this layer of soot, basically, on, um, in the atmosphere. And that's decreasing the amount of solar radiation that uh, is inputting those lakes. So those are two major factors contributing to the fact that uh, to lake water temperatures warming. Um, and I don't know if anybody saw this, but this was an ad from the Toronto Star that was on all sorts of public transportation, on subways and streetcars. So it's fun coming to work, seeing your research on the side of a subway, um, <laughs> which you don't get every day. OK, so what does this mean for lakes? So all this uh, earlier ice breakup, later ice freezing, and warming temperatures. And so uh, you can probably get a sense that I like doing big data uh, synthesis and working with lots of people around the world to get an idea <laughs> of how lakes are changing. And so here we looked at 101 lakes that measured uh, conditions in the water quality in the summer and in the winter under ice. And uh, what we found was, um, first it was the first global synthesis actually looking at winter and summer limnology, because winter limnology is not uh, something that people normally do. That's usually when we're teaching classes, so we don't go out sampling um, in the winter, typically. But some people do. And here, what I just want you to look at are chlorophyll levels. So chlorophyll levels are an indication of productivity, um, primary production in a lake. And, um, and what you can see is that in summer, the average chlorophyll value, which makes sense, is higher. It's, um, it's much higher than, it's almost twice, more than twice as high as in the winter. But in winter, there's still primary production going on. So we thought that the levels of primary production would be really low under the ice, but they're actually a lot higher than we would have uh, hypothesized. We also looked at phytoplankton. So these are you know, some small critters, microscopic critters, in the water column, and how, uh, what they're up to, actually, under the lake. And what you can see is that there's a lot more phytoplankton in the summer about six, uh, six times as much. But the same critters are in the, in the lake in the winter and in the summer. They're just at, not at high abundances. And so what does that mean for us? Well, what we've, we've been thinking about is that as it's sort of this mechanism that's involved. So as the ice breaks up earlier in the spring, that leads, uh, that has, a, leads to a longer, basically, growing season uh, and a longer time period for water temperatures to warm up in the lake. And what we've been noticing is that the, that usually corresponds to decreased water clarity and increased harm, harmful algal blooms. And so what we've, we've just submitted a grant to look at how climate change is contributing to decrease water quality and harmful algal blooms around the world over the past 20 years. Uh, and so here again, we have measurements from people and fellow scientists going out to collect information about their lakes. But in uh, Europe, there's actually uh, an effort. They've 
they've actually put all this data together and they're willing to share it for 4,000 lakes, looking at how chlorophyll has changed over the past 20 years from space. So the satellite measurements are getting to be a lot uh, more robust that we can actually look at water clarity and, um, and algal blooms from satellites to, to see if that's changing because of increased uh, water temperatures. All right, so now I'm gonna shift gears and think about the future. So that was all about what's already been happening. And hopefully I've convinced you that climate has already been impacting, uh, impacting lakes in Ontario, but also around the world. Uh, what does this mean for fisheries? And uh, the fish species that I sort of want to tell you a story about today is a smallmouth bass. Uh, so smallmouth bass is not native to Ontario, and, uh, but it's been increasing its range um, over time because of climate change, but also because of uh, people who love to fish for and eat um, smallmouth bass. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And then what are the consequences for native fisheries? And so the smallmouth bass is a, it's a warm water fish and the growth of its, uh, the growth rate of bass is correlated to temperatures in the summer. So here we've got mean peak summer temperatures and the mean fall length of the young of the year bass. And so if temperatures, it turns out, if temperatures are above 18 degrees Celsius in July, the young of the year, smallmouth bass get to be a big enough size that they can successfully survive the winter and form a self-sustaining population. Whereas if temperatures are below uh, 16 degrees Celsius, those, those fish don't get to be a big enough size to survive the winter. And bass have been moved, not just in Ontario, but around the world uh, in various ways. So first are anglers, so people who really like to uh, fish for smallmouth bass have been spreading them into lakes, even in uh, British Columbia. And so that's of concern because it may impact salmon and trout populations and their fishery, uh, fishery there. But they're spread around, around the world. In Ontario, actually, the government used to stock lakes with bass uh, back before they knew what the consequences were. So uh, they would ride the rails and as they would pass a lake uh, on the train, they would throw bass into the lake uh, to, to stock those lakes. For the lakes that they couldn't access by train, they would go over by airplane and fly over these lakes and just dump bass uh, into, into the lake from the, from the airplanes. Um, and then once, especially in Ontario, now that the climate's warm enough, they can just actually just disperse northwards, um, just uh, through river connections uh, and just through, through the landscape. And so uh, what we've been thinking about is what does this mean for uh, warm water fish? Uh, how are these different guilds of fish going to change under scenarios of climate change? And so the warm water invasives are fish like bass and you can see that their, uh, their abundances within a lake are actually not, there's not that many many of them. We mostly have cold water fishes, such as lake trout, you might have uh, heard of, or cool water fishes like perch and walleye um, that mostly compose our, our fish communities. And under scenarios of climate change, so in 2070 and different, uh, different types of scenarios, you can see that the that cold water fish are probably going to be extirpated locally extinct from Ontario lakes. And then we're actually already seeing evidence of these cold water fish being lost at their southern, um, southern range. And, and we'll end up with fish communities composed of cool water fish and warm water fishes. And so what does that mean for bass? So this is, uh, this is a map of where bass are right now. Um, when I was doing my PhD, bass were like right here. And uh, I was worried back then 
because I thought, okay, once they cross this continental divide and the drainage basins flow north, then the bass will naturally be able to disperse. Well, within like two years of me getting my PhD, the bass had crossed the continental divide. Um, and so now they're able to naturally disperse into, into lakes across on Ontario. And so this is bass now. This is a projection of what bass where bass might be in 2070. And uh, so what we do is we look at 126 different climate change scenarios and we estimate where, uh, how much air temperatures are gonna increase, uh, how much water temperatures are gonna increase, and then what is the likelihood of a bass surviving in those lakes. So if you see red, that means that most of the models agree uh, and there's a really high likelihood that bass are going to be in those lakes. Uh, I also want you to look at this scenario. So this is scenario 8.5. This is like the, my one tidbit of positive news. Uh, so I'm gonna highlight this. Uh, this is the business as usual uh, climate change scenario. So if we continue emitting greenhouse gas emissions at the rate that we're doing now, our, our whole province and in earlier models, most of the country will actually have suitable habitat for smallmouth bass. Well, what happens if we um, mitigate greenhouse gas emissions. Well, you can see that a lot of southern Ontario and uh, western Ontario will have suitable habitat for bass, but there's large regions in Ontario that there's only like a 50% likelihood that bass could survive there. And this gives me hope actually because this 2.6 scenario says that we can continue emitting greenhouse gases till 2030 at the current rate and then at that point, we have enough alternative technology, uh, clean air uh, resources, um, and just we've, we've stabilized. So we can increase till 2030 and then stabilize our greenhouse gas emissions. And we can see that it has dramatic impacts on, on our ecosystems. This is a story for walleye. So walleye is a cool water fish. And uh, does anybody? You might have heard walleye as, as pickerel as well. Um, so it's a, it's a popular sport fish and actually found throughout most of Ontario. It's, it's a very common fish. But under scenarios of climate change, we're expecting it to be, become locally, um, locally extinct. So southern Ontario will no longer have suitable habitat for walleye populations. And central Ontario, there's a 50% a likelihood that there will be habitat available for walleye. Um, and we expect this shift to, to more northern populations as our water temperatures become too warm. Cisco are a cold water fish, and they're actually the primary forage for lake trout. And uh, you can see that in Ontario, most of the lakes have uh, have cisco populations, but under climate change scenarios, you can see that they're just sort of relegated to the tips, the northern tips of Ontario. <coughs> this fish is actually already becoming locally extirpated in its southern range, so I've worked on it in Wisconsin, it's already disappearing, Indiana, Michigan, uh, this fish is already <coughs> being lost because the climate's too warm at its southern extent of its range. So it's a situation where we don't really have to wait for 50 years to see uh, what's 30 or 50 years for this fish to be lost. It's already um, becoming lost, but it will become less common in Ontario. So what does this mean? What does having smallmouth bass in these lakes actually mean? So why can't we just have a lakes that have uh, primary predators as bass and, uh, and just you know, keep going as, as we are now. Well, what happens when bass invade a lake is that they're really voracious predators and they consume a lot of the minnows uh, and decrease biodiversity within, um, within the lake. So you think, okay, minnow biodiversity, that's decreasing, not good, but maybe not the end of the world. The other problem is it affects these top predators indirectly. So. Uh, the Great Lakes fishery is worth $4.5 billion a year. The walleye fishery is worth, in Ontario, $7 billion a year. 
And it's being impacted by smallmouth bass in several ways. So you can see that walleye and bass don't usually live in the same area. But what happens is that uh, bass actually, because they outcompete, they can outcompete walleye for the forage fish in the shoreline that walleye need, uh, need to survive. And also they eat their young uh, when, when walleye are juveniles and really young. So they're decreasing, they're impacting walleye populations in two ways. Lake trout live in the cold water, they're called offshore regions typically, uh, but when they don't have these access to fish such as cisco and oxygen levels and water temperatures, oxygen levels decline and water temperatures increase in the offshore region, lake trout need to move up to the, to the near shore area. And so what we're finding is that lake trout are not able to access um, forage fish populations. And so their survival is reduced, their growth is reduced, and their ability to reproduce is reduced. And so lake trout populations are also being impacted by bass. So let's maybe take a look at walleye and bass again in a little more detail. So we can see that bass could theoretically be found across Ontario and walleye are being shifted northwards. Well, in this band here where walleye are vulnerable to reduced habitat, this is where bass have started moving in already and they're increasing the vulnerability of walleye populations through, through interactions in the food web. In the areas that walleye may have suitable habitat, that's where bass are expected to move north and that might in further uh, increase their vulnerability of walleye populations. So what we went through actually, so Ontario has a great fish record for lakes around, uh, around the province. And what we found is that, so we've got lakes with bass and we've got lakes with no bass, and this is an abundance of walleye. There's three times fewer walleye already in lakes that have bass in them because of predation and competition. And so this, this stress is already visible and apparent for walleye populations in Ontario, but also actually in Wisconsin, where they're finding similar, uh, similar patterns. And what does that mean for the rest of the community? So we've looked at how climate change may impact you know, several main uh, top predators and socioeconomically important fish species, but also wondering how that might affect the fish community in general. So what we're uh, predicting here is maximum length, and you can see under scenarios of climate change that the fish are expected to be smaller. Um, so we're expecting more smaller forage fishes in, to predominate these communities. Um, if we look at the types of fishery, uh, what I want you to uh, see here is in red is commercial and sport fish, blue is forage and bait, and pan is in yellow. And what you can see is under scenarios of climate change, as we uh, progress into the future, we're expecting the loss of the commercial and sport fishery in Ontario inland lakes. And so you might expect our, in cartoon form, our, our lakes might, uh, are, are really diverse. We've got this iconic Canadian fishery in Ontario where uh, we have a combination of cool and cold water predators. We have a lot of biodiversity within our lakes and this unique Canadian fishery that attracts um, socioeconomic resources to, to come here to, to fish for, uh, for fish in our lakes. What we're expecting for the future is the loss of predators, the loss of the sport and commercial fishery, and uh, just a change in the fish composition to these warm water predators and smaller forage, um, forage and bait fishes where it might not be sort of representative of our iconic Canadian fishery. But in good news is that if we mitigate our greenhouse gas emissions, we can, we can expect our fishery to sort of still resemble um, what, we have, what we have currently. And so I've told you two depressing stories, uh, but there's always a silver lining. Uh, so lakes have been warming rapidly and um, losing ice may have a lot of consequences for 
the biology of lakes, but also for us as uh, northern, uh, northern residents who enjoy winter. Um, and secondly, by 2050, lakes across Ontario may be at risk of losing biodiversity, uh, in particular native cool water and cold water predators. But uh, we can actually, I think we can do something about it. One we have, uh, so first is, you know, thinking about mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. When we, we're doing all these climate change scenarios and we realize that we have 15 years to actually put into place these greener technologies, cleaner technologies, uh, that gives me hope because 15 years is a long time. And I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of push that we want to actually we recognize that climate change is a problem. We're experiencing extreme events. And I think people want to do something about it uh, to improve like air quality, water quality that we leave um, for our children. The second is invasive species. So the number one, once an invader in, uh, enters an ecosystem, you can't really deal with it then. It's really, really expensive. You've probably heard of stories about the sea lamprey and now the Asian carp that's sort of knocking at our door. Um, but the key for invaders is prevention because once they get in, um, Asian carp release 20,000 eggs per spawning event. Uh, once they're here and they have reproducing populations, we really can't do anything about it. Um, so prevention is key. And that prevention for invasive species really means please don't spread your your species. So if you're, you know, there's a story about a person who had a snakehead. I don't know if you guys know this story, but there's a snakehead fish and it's a really ancient fish that, that has both lungs and gills and it can survive out of water for a few days. And so in Maryland, there was a, a girl that was really sick and her brother went to Asia and got some snakehead uh, because he was gonna make her some snakehead soup that would, that would help make her feel better. But by the time he get, got back, she was fine. So then he put the snakehead in, in tanks, but they get to be about four feet long. And so he released them into a native, just a pond just down the street. But as I mentioned, they snakehead, they release 20,000 eggs per spawning event. They spawn four times a year. And uh, they have these really sharp teeth and they're voracious predators. They'll eat like small dogs, small cats, mammals, they'll eat anything and they can survive out of water. And so the snakehead actually just moved from pond to pond by walking on, uh, on land to, to the next pond. And it was just one guy who brought them over. And that's actually how invasive species are generally spread. It's one person or a few individuals that, that you know, feel bad for the organism they brought in rather than uh, killing the species, individuals, they, they release them. Or, you know, the pet trade, the aquarium trade that actually brings in a lot of invasive species. So just education on, on knowing not to spread, spread your invaders can help our ecosystem. So uh, I'll wrap up again with some thanks and I'll take any questions.